Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. I'm so happy to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're glad that you can be with us, whether or not you are at home, uh, in your car, hopefully you're not driving while you're watching this, but we're glad that you're with us here today. Um, today, we are going to continue the series called His Story, where we're going to be looking at the stories of men in Scripture that were able to provide a, a, an example for us to follow today. Now, there's so much that has been happening the last couple of weeks and um, so many people have been asking, uh, with the uh, George Floyd protests and the incidents that have been happening uh, since then, what are we to do as individuals? Where can we as a church move forward? And how can we stand um, in, in favor of justice, which is a, a, an idea that Pastor Lafitte was talking about last week, as we're trying to live in a practical way in this world that we're living in. And I, my, my sermon was starting to take several different forms, but I finally decided to look at the story of a man who is... In, the, in another book of the Bible, actually. It's about a woman. And um, I'm just going to pop up this, uh, this slides up there. We're calling it the Mordecai Principle. We're going to be looking at the story of Mordecai, who some people believe that he is a, the, the uncle, but he's actually the cousin of Queen Esther. Um, the, the idea behind that was that Esther was an orphan, and Mordecai, who was her older cousin, adopted her and took her as his daughter, as a sort of daughter. So he eventually became like her uncle, Tio Padre, but he was actually her, her cousin. But before we get into this, I want to give a disclaimer. Today's sermon, as I was preparing it, really moved me and convicted me in several ways. And whenever I feel excited about a sermon, I know that there is there's something that I need to prepare people for. And it's that it might leave you uncomfortable. I know that uh, Pastor, um, uh, what's his name? I, I, I blank on his name, but he was our pastor from the Peregrinos. He delivered a sermon where he said to, told his congregation, some of you are going to be upset with me on Facebook and you might block me on Twitter. The same thing might happen here because the idea is that I love preaching messages that leave you feeling good. I love preaching messages that inspire hope and, and give us uh, the, the idea to reflect on what God is doing for us and what God could do. But there sometimes comes sermons where God has to confront us. If God is actually a friend of ours who cares about us, then he should presumably care enough about us to tell us things that he knows might be difficult. Does that make sense? I mean, if God is a God who loves us, then a real friend would tell us, the things that we want to hear, and even the things that we don't want to hear. So today's message, I feel, is a, is, a, is a sermon that is going to convict and maybe confront everybody. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Hispanic, if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican. I feel that in some way, there's going to be no stone left unturned in today's message. So I want to prepare you that this might hurt a little bit, but it's going to be for your own good. God is going to be refining you through this message. The second thing is that this message is primarily going to be targeted for Adventists. Now, I know that we have many people who are fellow Christ followers that watch our stream that are not Adventists. You might be from a different, um, different religion or a different uh, denomination, and we're really glad that you join us today. Some of the things you're going to hear me say might not make a whole lot of sense because I'm talking to my tribe, but if you have any questions, please feel free to send us an email. I'd be more than happy to personally follow up with you about any questions you may have about this. But um, the folks that are Adventists, a lot of you guys should know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's issues that I'm going to be presenting that you may never have heard of before. Because we're going to be delving a bit into history and a little bit into Scripture and seeing how the two meet. So I am gearing this for Adventists. So with that being said, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray today. Father God, I want to thank you again for this time you've given us. Thank you for being able to come together for a few minutes and look at the story of Mordecai, this man of faith in the Bible. And we ask God that you would be with each one of us today and help us, Father, to be receptive to your word today, God. This is my prayer. And give me the words to speak. I'm going to need that in your name. Amen. So uh, if you've never seen the book of Esther, have never studied it. It's a wonderful book. It is, believe it or not, the only book of the Bible that does not explicitly mention the name of God. That's yeah, true. God doesn't show up there. He doesn't, unlike in other books of the Bible, God doesn't show up in a physical form. He's not mentioned. He's not referenced in a, in a, in a way like in other books of the Bible. He shows up and, and people allude to him saying, God told me this, or God clearly revealed himself to me this way. None of that happens in this book. That, that doesn't happen. Um, instead, you could say that the way God works is through people, which is why I think it's a very perfect example of what kind of book 
we need to be studying today because Esther is a book that in many ways mirrors what we're talking about in our, in our everyday life. We don't have an umin and a thumbin that, that, that God answers your questions automatically. We can't go to a church and hey, say, hey, Jesus, listen, we're having these issues over these George Floyd incidents. What do you suggest? And God doesn't say, okay, um, listen, you got to follow A, B, C, D, E. He doesn't say that. Instead, we're trying to figure this out in a way that we don't have clear, um, thus saith the Lord, if you will. So this is why this is a perfect book to study today. But Mordecai shows up. And uh, again, his story is that he is Esther's older cousin who adopts her and the story is mostly about Esther how she is brought to the palace and how she's chosen queen to replace Queen Vashti who we preached about uh, a couple of years ago or maybe last year but it's it's a great story for us to look at um, and the story of Mordecai is one even though he plays a minor role if you will uh, compared to the other characters in the story his role is absolutely vital to understand um, in terms of what it means to be a man of integrity a man of faith and a man who acts in the circumstances that he finds himself in. So the story we're going to look at is the story of Mordecai and his nemesis Haman. And Haman is the main bad guy of the story. He's the antagonist. He's the one that basically wants to kill everybody. And how the Bible sets this up is very fascinating. It says in Esther's chap Esther chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 to give you a little bit of setup. It says, after these things King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of that's, one, that's a, good, a great tongue twister. Hamadetatha. Please do not name your children that. Um, the Agagite. And that's a clear one. I'm, we'll get back to Agagite in a second. And advance him and, and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Okay, so a few things we want to unpack. One, Haman is called an Agagite. And that is a, a, a term for a people who were descendants of King Agag. He is an, uh, an Old Testament king. If I'm not mistaken, he was a king of the Amalekites. It's one of the ites in the, in the Old Testament. And long story short, there was beef, long-standing beef between the Amalekites um, and the, the descendants of Agag, that king, and the Hebrews, as with obvious consequences, because God said, these are individuals who you need to wipe out. Israel didn't wipe them out. And so they stayed on. So they had this festering issue with each other for, for generations. And so he's a descendant of this group of people. And Mordecai is a descendant of the Hebrews. And it's clear that there's already a little bit of beef in terms of ethnicity among them, if you will. Does that make sense? Nod your head with me if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, even in the TV. I know it's a little weird, but just follow me, okay? The second thing to look at is that um, as we look back at the text here, if we can just pop that up on the screen, the bottom here it says that all the king's servants who were with the king bowed and paid homage to him. For so the king had commanded concerning him. Think about the religious uh, power that was back in those days. There was not a democracy. There was not a cabinet. There, there was the king's word. This was a monarchy. So the king's word was law. Does that make sense? The king's word was law because whatever the king wanted, the king got because that's a monarchy. In terms of a democracy, it's a different, it's a, it's a different system altogether. But the law back then said that uh, uh, Haman, this Aga guy, he was now a, a, a ranked official. And the idea was that the people that saw him were supposed to bow down, bow down to him and pay homage to say, you know, we're so glad that you are here and all that. But Mordecai refused a legal law. Whoa, hold up. So the next slide, as you're going to go here, says... This is where the issue first gets brought up because this was a law because the king had said everyone must bow down. But Haman noticed that this guy wasn't bowing down and it bugged him to death. He's like, who's this guy that even though I'm walking around, the law says this guy is supposed to bow down and he's standing up. This, oh, oh, hold up. Isn't that guy a Hebrew? Oh, no. Oh, I, listen, I know where that's coming from. He's probably doing that because of my heritage. Okay, so he's taking it there. Oh, okay, okay. So he was upset not only with 
his individual action. He must have been thinking about the whole history of what happened with their clans and his people. And this is going to show up in the story later on. But he's thinking, oh, this guy, I can't do this. No, 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 no. Ah, no. This guy's trying to be a little bit of ethnic racism. Ah, no. Ah, this can't happen. So he started putting the word out. He said, what's going on with uh, Mordecai? He's, uh, he doesn't seem to be following the laws. And so the other um, prince says, they go to Mordecai. And they go uh, the next time, Morty, Mor Morty, what's going on, brother? Like, listen, this guy's coming through, and you're the only one that's not bowing down. What's the deal? You're the only one. And so Mordecai, in response, says this. Uh, now it happened when they spoke to him daily. These were the princes who kept on insisting, and Mordecai, 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 why don't you bow, man? He says that he would not listen to them. Uh, and when they told it to Haman to see if Mordecai's words were to stand. For Mordecai told them that he was a Jew. Now, you could simply say that, oh, listen, yeah, maybe Mordecai was thinking, no, I'm a Jew. This guy's an ad guy. Nah, man, this is, this is, we don't, we don't see eye to eye. So everybody else I would bow down for, but this guy, nah, man, not that guy. He's, he's the worst. <laughs> he's an ad guy, but not so. He's a Jew. Remember, a little bit of world history context. Um, this takes place after the story of Daniel and the lion's den and Daniel and his friend Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who were also faithful Jews who, when their turn came to bow down and pay homage in that way, in that physical manifestation, that physical prostrating form to something else, this time it was a statue, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were ordered to fall down, prostrate in front of uh, another, another um, image in this case, which was also a law. They said, King, listen, yes, your, law, your word may be law, but we are God-fearing Jews. And our scriptures tell us that we must not worship anyone other than God. We can't worship anyone else. So Mordecai's refusal to bow down to Haman was not necessarily on race, not about culture. It was about the fact that he on principle said, I cannot bow down before anyone else because I am a Jew. I am a faithful, faithful Jew. So what ends up happening here in the rest of verse, uh, verses 4 to 6, it says, when Haman, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but his disdain to lay hands on, but his disdain to lay hands on Mordecai alone for he had told them of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole king, the kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So do you see how this individual beef with somebody, one person, translated into corporate beef with everybody that looked like him, everybody who was like him? It, this generalization, oh, this one guy did this one thing, so you know they all got to be like that. When, again, Haman was looking at this in the wrong way because he's like, hold up. This guy, he's probably a Jew and I'm a, a, a Agagite. So that's probably where that beef is. But Mordecai must have been like, listen, I don't, you could have been Canadian. You could have been Dominican. You could have been a Babylonian. The point is I'm a Jew and I don't worship in front of everybody. I take a point uh, to, to follow my principles. I don't simply just do things because whatever. And this is the Mordecai principles. There's three of them. One is your allegiance before country, party, or culture must be to God. I want to say that again. Your allegiance before country, party, or culture must be God. God must have your undivided attention, your undivided allegiance. As a matter of fact, Adventists, if you need a reminder, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, worship and praise doesn't mean only f falling down prostrate and um, giving your, you could say, your, your, your homage towards, like you're bowing down. Worshiping is anything that we give our undivided time to, what we spend time talking about, what we spend time reflecting on, what we spend time looking at and hearing. Whatever we worship is what we spend the most time doing. And some of you guys aren't worshiping the Lord God Almighty. Some of you guys worship the Democratic Party. Some of you guys worship the Republicans more than spend time with God. And how do I know this? Because I see online. I see your news feeds. I see the conversations you guys are having. And again, I'm not talking about the people out there. I'm talking about Miami Temple, and I'm talking about Adventists across the world. 
I see it. It's disturbing. The first thing that Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to do is to remind people, especially the three angels' message, to say, the first angels' message says, behold, behold, there, there, there is judgment coming and worship God, the creator of heaven and earth, remembering that our position is not to say, hey, listen, man, I'm a Democrat. And so the Republicans, they're the Antichrist. Now, Republicans, you can't be like, ah, listen, no, no. The Democrats, it's, it's their principles that are going to bankrupt the country, which are things that people have actually said. Again, you're equating your ideological beliefs with your religious belief. And if you remember the story, the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, every single empire that exists, they all tumble down at the end before the feet of God who in that rock destroys everything and his kingdom is the only thing that preserves that that remains so nothing that you have no other allegiance needs your attention you are a servant of God and if you are not clear on that you have another God before the Lord I told you this is probably gonna leave you a little bit uncomfortable and it's leaving me a little uncomfortable but it needs to be said it needs to be said and again, I didn't just base that on just, hey, I had this idea and I just wanted to do it. This is what the text says. King uh, Ahasuerus had this law, and we'll get to that in a second. And Mordecai refused to take a stand based on principle because he was a God-fearing Jew. So let's go here to the next section, and I'm going to combine a few ideas together because I know some people are like, hold up, where are you taking this, Pastor? <laughs> uh, follow me, I'm going somewhere. So it says in Esther chapter 3, verse 8, 9, a little bit later on, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, listen, there's a certain people that are scattered and dispersed among all the peoples and all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, if it pleases, sees, therefore, if it's fitting for the king, let them, it's not pleasing to the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of the people who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So this is one example of, uh, if to use this idea of fake news, because uh, here Haman gives King Ahasuerus a half-truth. Technically, yes, they're a different people with different laws, but he didn't specifically say who it was and what laws those were. They were religious laws. He gave him this idea of like, they have this own kingdom and they're doing their own thing and they're not paying taxes and they're worshiping other things. And listen, you're, you're the only one they're supposed to worship. And so he gave, gives them this different spin on what's happening. And so the king's like, no, man, yeah, take care of them. Plus we have some money in the treasury that's going to come from their plunders. Absolutely. Make it law. Again, there was no, um, <laughs> there was no committee there was no uh, study on this. this th listen, the king said it as the law. It is what it is. The king made it, and that's the law. This leads me to the second principle. Remember, Mordecai disobeyed the first law, even though it was a legal command. And now here comes the second command, where um, King Ahasuerus basically is now giving uh, uh, Haman full power to destroy now, if it were, the Jews, because of his own personal beef and vendetta against Mordecai. And now, by extension, the rest of the Jews. And so uh, the second Mordecai principle says that legality is not the same. A amorality, you know, I was supposed to say. Legality is not the same as morality. Legality is not the same as morality, folks. It's not. Absolutely not. So to give you some historical context, um, I have a few slides here. It says apartheid in South Africa was legal. The Holocaust in Germany was legal. No one found out about it. It was a state-run uh, killing system. Slavery in the United States and other places was legal until it was abolished in the 1600s, 1700s. Colonialism, the expansion of different, uh, uh, different, different world power groups and conquering land that wasn't theirs in different re realities, it was legal. So legality is a matter of power. It's not a proof of morality. So when we talk about um, the laws that are going, in, in other words, that were happening back then, um, and I use that intentionally. Back then, there were certain laws that were clear that uh, were against the character of God. So it's like, what kind of laws then should you follow versus what kind of laws should you disobey? Martin Luther King Jr. had this to say when he was thinking about this concept. He said, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. So I, I'm not, I don't have time to unpack this idea, but he mentioned that there were certain laws that were accordance with God's laws, his infinite moral law, and that was the 
law that all Christians ought to subject themselves to. And then there's these other laws that are human laws, which in, the, in and of themselves are not um, one way or another. They're simply just laws that people make. But there's certain laws that are very much amoral, that you, 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 don't, you can't follow them because principle doesn't allow you to do that. Your principle just, your principle just don't allow you to do that. And the idea is that we all have certain principles, of course, as individuals. But the idea is that when we are Christians, we look at what God has to say to us about not only our, the, 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 you could say the, the spin that our perfect political party is talking about. Like, for example, you can't just simply say that, well, we care about immigrants and we don't care about religious liberty or we only care about abortion and we don't care about, um, you know, equal protection, all stuff like that. The idea is justice is to demand the good of all people, no matter the context. But again, because we've made our idols into our ideological ideas, we fight with each other about who's right, the left or the right, when you forget that they're both playing you. So you remember last week when the president, now use this idea, again, I'm going to step on everybody's toes. You're both getting it this time. President Trump, he went in front of a church and held up a Bible. And it was a, uh, a photo op, uh, basically playing into uh, the Republican base. The idea is like, listen, this church was looted by looters, but I respect the Bible and I respect the government. Cool. A few days later, the Republic, uh, the Democrats, they wore like uh, these, these African sashes, whatever. And they knelt down like Colin Kaepernick in a sign of solidarity, um, basically showing they, allow, again, as a, as, a, as a way of showing to their constituents that, listen, we got your back. If you as an Adventist can't see that both of these parties are playing you, I've got a, a can of magical beans at home that you're going to email me after the sermon because I need to sell them to you. You remember, folks, that at some point in our eschatology, the Bible tells us that the lamb, that the, that the, in Revelation chapter 13, that the beast with two horns is going to turn on everybody. And it's not the Republican Party, and it's not the Democratic Party. It's the United States of America. That is how Adventists, we've historically interpreted this to mean. So, again, whether or not it's a Democrat, whether or not it's a Republican, you can't sit back and be like, ah, it was the Democrats, I told you. Or it was, ah, the Republicans, so good on me. At some point, you've got to remember, Jesus is saying, I am not a Democrat, I am not a Republican. Stop posting this on your walls on Facebook. Stop fighting about it. Talk more about me. When's the last time you cracked open your Bible? Again, legality is not the same as morality, and our allegiance has to be before God, before anything else. So, what happened in the, in the Americas before all this happened. So again, one of the things you have to understand about today's situation we find ourselves in is that um, these things didn't just happen overnight. There's a long history with race relations in the United States. And I'll speak as a, an American. I was born and raised here. My parents are immigrants. Um, but I, 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 I was born and raised here in this country. I love this country. I, I love it. But at the same time, I know at one point it's going to betray me. So I'm holding these two tensions together. But um, back in the 1900s, Ellen White shared a little bit about uh, what was happening. Oh, excuse me, her son. This is um, J.E. White. I think it was Edson White, if I'm not mistaken. He, he talked about the challenges that he faced, uh, the discrimination he faced down here in the South, specifically in working for black people. Um, he says, this rule of—oh, uh, by the way, he's quoting a lawmaker of the South here when he's writing this. He says, the rule of color and law of race has always been preserved in the South. We have treated the Negro always kindly and considerably, but always with a firmness that could not be misunderstood. We have built him a house, but we have not permitted him the liberties of our own. We have built him a church, but have not allowed him to mingle with us in worship. We have built him a schoolhouse and tax ourselves to support it, but we have seen it that his children have not mingled with our children in the study hall, on the playground, or elsewhere. We have treated him justly, but in doing so, we have also been just to ourselves. In doing this, we have simply enforced nature's law and obeyed the will of the being who created a superior and inferior race. So did you know that people use the Bible to justify the racism? The idea was that God had made a certain hierarchy and order in races, which race in itself is a social construct. It was a way that, that people use science to justify racist beliefs. But I have a book coming out about that later on this year. You'll get more information on that later on. The point is that there was already these prejudices that people experienced um, 
in the in the in the in the formation of uh, the work of the church in the early 1900s, and um, in this context, for example, Miami Temple. Uh, we started in 1910, 1911. My memory is, is escaping right now. And we started in downtown Miami. And when we began, there was a white church and a black church. We came from the same evangelistic series. Uh, the, the same evangelist came and he preached to both blacks and white. Blacks and white got baptized. But when we as a, as a church, I'm talking about Miami Temple here. Miami Temple started. We started as the white church. And Bethany Seventh-day Adventist Church was the black church and they were governed by different administrative structures within the same denomination we'll get to that in a second so again there was this idea that superior inferior race but I, that's not it after um the lo- the south lost the civil war um and we had to face the issues of uh, integration uh there wasn't a, an immediate push to integrate in society there was um let me go back here this sentiment among people, uh, specifically white lawmakers, it says, we have the power to pass stringent laws uh, to govern the Negroes. This is a blessing, for they must be controlled in some way, or white people cannot live among them. This is from the book, The New Jim Crow. Fascinating book. I encourage you to check it out for yourself to, to understand the context and the history. And again, when we look at what's been the history of America, it's been since 1526, and by you are saying, hold up, 1526, America wasn't founded in 1526. It was founded in 1776. Of course it was, but in 1526, the Spaniards were here, and there was a story about how there was a group of 100 African slaves that were brought to the coast of uh, either Georgia or South Carolina, and then they were here. So slavery has been in America since about 1526. 1600, 1700, 1800, 1865 happens, the, the Civil War happens, and uh, Abraham Lincoln comes and he frees the slaves and we think oh then it got better because Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and then it's segregation separate but equal in the country for another 89 years until Martin Luther King and, and Malcolm X come in and Malcolm X was really mean and said some really hard things but Malcolm uh, Martin Luther King Jr. you know said a lot of good things and and you know we, we he had a dream and we liked his options better than Malcolm X's and so uh, we, we, we want him instead. But unfortunately, he was killed. But the good thing is that the person that killed him is now in jail. And it's unfortunate that the person, well, he wasn't in jail. They, they killed him before too long. So if you go, go back to that slide. So the, the, the narrative here is that you see how it's red and then it's yellow and then it's green. So the idea is that we're living in the green now, right now. So everything is fixed. There's no racial issues anymore. We're all in harmony. Guess what? We even had a black president. So we must be living in a post-racial society. There must be no problems. Solution has it's been found. So all these people that are talking about injustice and all this systematic racism, we don't even know what they're talking about because we fixed the problem. The last racist was in jail. He's the one that shot Martin Luther King Jr. Do you... S- like, this is what a lot of people believe. It's, 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 listen, I, I, I'll take this from a friend of mine because uh, I don't take credit for this. I'm not uh, gifted enough to think of this. I thought it was great. My friend Sean Brace said, um, you've never seen anyone saying, listen, let's just talk about Jesus. And let's, the, nobody, don't, let's not talk about abortion. Let's just talk about Jesus. Nobody says that. Let's just talk about Jesus. Let's not talk about, um, you know, the, 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 the kids that have been in, put in cages. Let's just talk about Jesus. No. Let's just talk about Jesus. Don't talk about, you know, uh, the, the, the importance of uh, temperance. Again, the Adventist church, we literally marched with the temperance movement to get the, uh, the, the, the 13th, uh, not 13th Amendment, to get the uh, prohibition passed. Of course, it was ratified by later amendment, but the, but the idea is that the church united around this idea of saying we can support principles, we can support movements that are in line with what Martin Luther King Jr. described as the moral law of God. And so it's never been for an Adventist, it's never been that we just keep our beliefs of God here and then our beliefs about how things should be governed in the regular world here. So of course you're entitled to your opinion, everyone is, but again we must remember that as Christians we should see eye to eye and we shouldn't divide to say that there's certain issues that are the left, certain issues that are the right, and even though they're both issues that God talks about in the Bible, justice, fairness, equality, uh, the idea of people working hard and, and making something of themselves, these are not 
um, different ideas. God says both of these things. But when we segregate ourselves into ideological parties, we cripple the body of Christ. We give a terrible example to the world. And we don't know, quite frankly, what we're talking about when we do this. Now, let's go back to Mordecai for a second. Mordecai goes back and he tells Queen Esther. Uh, so remember, there, there's this law that Haman makes that he's going to make all the people kill the Jews. And Esther, she wants to stay quiet. She doesn't know what to do. She's like, I, I, maybe I should just kind of ride this out and maybe the problem will take care of itself. And Mordecai tells her this. If, for if you remain silent at this time, relief, oh man. Listen, pay attention to this one, everybody. Turn on your listening ears. Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And your father's house will perish. And who knows whether or not you have attained royalty for such a time as this. I want you to look at the, the words that are highlighted. Silent, relief and deliverance, perishing, royalty, this. Listen, church, the Mordecai principle number three says, God will still save his people. Come on, somebody. God will act, but God will not allow silence to go unnoticed, especially from leaders. Mordecai went back and said, listen, you can stay quiet, and God will still find a way through this. <laughs> because God is God. God can't be stopped. God will do his thing, and he will enact perfect justice. He will be the one that does it. But you, Esther, you, if you stay quiet, you and your parents' house, your father's house, Pa fuera. Pa fuera. Pa fuera. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your job, Esther. You're going to go out. Because God's still going to do his thing. Because if you remain silent, God is going to move you out. So who knows if you were put, put into position of royalty for such a time as this. We talk about that a lot. But this is the context that he was giving those, that word of advice in. He says, you are here not because of your own accord you're here because God demanded it so you can speak but when the time comes you must also act because you are a leader and if you stay quiet or if you fail to act that's going to be on you so she thinks about it she prays about it and she does something wonderful story she sets up this elaborate banquet and Mordecai by the way helps her helps her out with this which is important Mordecai didn't get personally involved but he knew the system well enough to be able to talk to Esther how to make positive change happen. And when we talk about making changes happen, it's not simply about saying, I'm just going to just, you know, throw, like, I'm going to throw this through the window, make my voice heard. The idea is that you got to know the system. You've got to know how to work in an ethical and honest way. Just like the early church pioneers, I'm talking about Adventism. They didn't just simply just say whatever. They worked. And I said, we will not cease to promote with pen and voice. And action. She said, listen, uh, and I'll probably share this another one later. She says, if it's possible, you, she's talked about temperance movement. She said, if it was impossible to vote on time other than Sabbath for the temperance movement, for example, she said, vote on Sabbath. This might blow your minds. Again, I'm talking to Adventists. So if you're an Adventist, you understand what I'm talking about, and you don't have to fight with me. You don't have to send me a letter. I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm just saying you have to wrestle with your history. This is your church. This is what Ellen White did and how she counseled people how to navigate this very muddy, murky world of politics. This is how she did it. And um, yeah, so, so Ellen, uh, going back to, not Ellen White, but now Esther. Esther goes back and she says this wonderful thing. It's you, Haman. And so um, the king, go back to the slides here for a second. The king's like, hold up. It was you, Haman? Nah, man. So he takes off Haman's head, literally. And um, he, he makes another law saying that Esther's family and all the Jews can fight to defend themselves against the people that are trying to slaughter them. So they fight, long story short, they win, and they make a holiday out of it. And it's a holiday that's still celebrated today, Purim. Like people right now, this is real, people actually still celebrate Purim, Jews do, because of that one time they, they, they beat someone up in a fight because they were trying to kill them in ancient Mesopotamia. Isn't that, I mean, it's one of the highlights of the year for the Jews. It's a fantastic year. Like, we, we should do fun things like that, but hopefully not for the same reasons. But what I'm saying is that they, they, they know how to turn an otherwise tragic situation 
and to make it something celebratory where they saw the power of God working. And they wrote about it in a book that never includes God's name. But you see God's power clearly working through Esther, through Mordecai as her example, and her cousin, father, and, and father figure. And, and the same thing can happen today. We can celebrate God's action. We can celebrate God's leading. We can tell the world about the great things God can do because God is good, because God will do it. And point them back to a Savior named Jesus Christ, who one day will make all things new. But here's again why I'm making another, some people mad. When it comes to race relations in this world, Adventists need to be quiet. We have zero moral uh, credibility to stand on as a denomination when it comes to telling the world what to do, how they should act, what they should or should not be doing about fixing the current issues of race. Because it might come to a surprise to many of you as it was to some of our members uh, that were in our Members of Miami Temple page when we were discussing how to act this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church currently still has um, institutionalized segregation at the conference level. So the church, our church, has four levels of governance. There's the local church, which we're in right now. There's a local conference. There's the union. And then there's the, the general conference uh, right here. So you can see it. So one, two, three, four, the top one. Uh, divisions are extensions of the general conference. They are not their own independent entity. But conferences have their own constituency sessions and bylaws. Same thing with unions. Same thing with divisions and the general conference. Um, at the conference level, which is the, the next one up from churches, we have segregated conferences where there is a black administrative structure and or white or Latino Hispanic structure or a mixed structure. We can call those state conferences or regional conferences. Um, they're not they're not black com they're not black unions it's when you're talking about this important it's important to understand the terminology um, because if not then when you're having conversation with someone it seems like you don't know what you're talking about um, and so they're called regional conferences they're called state conferences the black and white conferences uh, that is and it's an unfortunate reality that still exists in our church and you might be wondering why did, why are these things here why did they start well, it's a long and messy history, and I won't have time, unfortunately, to cover that up. Or, Well, <laughs> I didn't cover it up. History covers it up, apparently, because a lot of people don't know that it existed. But it'll take a long time to cover. But to give you the short version, there was ongoing systemic um, discrimination in hiring practices, leadership representation, and, um, and follow-through in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'll give you a few examples. This is taken from my book, Talking Over Haystacks. One, although the equivalent departments of Germans and the Scandinavians, there, there were departments to do outreach to Germans and Scandinavians in the Adventist church. They were led by people in their targeted ethnicity, ethnicities. So Germans and Scandinavians were, were leading them. For nine years, in 1909 through 1918, the North American Negro department was led by a white man. So a white guy led the black department. Even though everyone could speak English, even though the Germans and the Scandinavians already had leaders that could do it, the black people couldn't do it. The editor of The Message, the denomination's magazine for black leadership, had a white man as its editor for 13 years, from 1932 to 1945. Another one, until 1932, Oakwood. Y'all know Oakwood. Oakwood is top administration. That is the historically black Adventist University. It's an HBCU. They're, all their leaders were white. They were all white. And that's just a few examples. If you want more examples, you can look at um, the, 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 the Bird incident that happened in Washington where a woman who was actually black but she was white passing she looked white they admitted her in a hospital an adventist hospital and then when they found out she was black they kicked her out and she died that one one of our and she was adventist too this happened so again let me not go in 1975 i am nelson fernandez am half dominican half salvadorian so there were people in my family that took issues with my parents union but they weren't Adventists, so okay, you might be like, all right, whatever. Maybe they had issues. In my wedding, we had family members that refused to come to our wedding because my wife is light-skinned and I'm Dike Black. Did, okay, I'm not talking about ancient history. I'm talking about this is the person you're looking at that's preaching to you, me. I had that said to me from Adventists. Adventists refused to come to my wedding, and they gave me Ellen White quotes about amalgamation between races, et lo otro. And so, again, 
I'm not talking about the people out there. I'm talking about the people in our church that are sitting here on Sabbath morning. You, all of us that are watching, there's racism in here. Now, let me give you more. Ah, oh, man, I, Marlon, if this goes long, just cut some stuff out. Whatever, if, if it's going to go long. Let me give you a little word about William H. Green. He was the first black director of the Negro Department of the General Conference. He said this, It was very uncomfortable when he first started working at the GC. For me at first, I could not eat in the General Conference cafeteria with everyone else. Some whites would not even greet you when you, they saw you in the morning. When they saw you coming, they would look, you, but look, look by you. There would be no greeting at all. This was largely on the part of the women folk, but once in a while the men did it too. So the conclusion that was brought to by um, these two historians named Bull and Lockhart. They're non-Adventists looking at the history of Adventism, wondering why is it that the regional conferences, state conference system was established. Their conclusion was that Adventism was still a white movement with a mission to white America, and blacks were not allowed to jeopardize the evangelistic objectives of that denomination. So they said that white churches wanted to remain white. Therefore, they said to keep them separate was the best idea in order to not offend the whites. And this is going to be something that make a lot of people uncomfortable. When it comes to integration, historically, it has been easier for minorities to integrate into white churches than white churches to assimilate back into minority churches. Exhibit A, Miami Temple. So we started as the white church, but over time, there were... In, there, were, there were people that came to our church that were black. We have people in our church right now that you can talk to them, and they'll tell you when they first started coming here, the person greeting them at the door. Th these are people that have been here for years and years. I'm not talking about two years ago. I'm talking about years ago. That they were told by the greeter, oh, you may want to go to such and such church over there because that's a black church. We were told that once it started being okay for black people to come, they were allowed to come, but they had to sit up at the balcony. I spoke to them. They told me that story. I know that. And I can tell you who it was, but I'm not going to. So we're not talking about ancient history. We're talking about people that I can point you to right now. Say that happened to this person. But yet we want to talk about, no, let's not talk about this. This is just issues out there. And everybody can, la gente afuera, people out there, they're talking and making all this mess. When most people in Miami, they don't even know that this existed. I didn't know about this until I left Miami. So let me tell you something. Your experience as a person of color here in Miami might be different because you're born in Miami or raised in Miami or because we are a melting pot in Miami. I can guarantee you that if you were in Macon, Georgia, your experience would be different. Like me, I was preaching, in, I, I pastored two churches in South Carolina. There's two occasions that came to mind. One, where I was standing at the door greeting someone after I finished preaching and this guy was a, was a, was a Mexican. We started talking in Spanish and this guy behind him was white and he shakes my hand and he's like pastor I, I i could have sworn you had some negro blood in you how is it you're speaking spanish and I, and I had explained to him that black people can speak spanish too one of my uh friends who was a dear member who passed away um one time i came to church and i decided to not come to church with a tie on and he was an old rabbi and he said pastor you 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 need to come to church with a tie next time you look like a bushman Bushman. I want you to look that up in case you don't know what that is. That means like a savage, an African savage. Here's the thing. They probably didn't mean it in a negative way, but your experience gives you your perception of the world, of what you think is acceptable to say or what not to say. So you may be like, what's this issue? What's the issue with, I don't see race. Again, it may be that you've never encountered racism like I have or like other people of color have, but your experience might be different if you live in another part of the world. And it doesn't mean that what they're seeing and experiencing isn't true. And this is where we have to start having conversations about what people have experienced. And let's not start with out there. Let's start with in the church. So in the church, if we want to fix this, go back to the Mordecai principles. Before I fall down here, Mordecai principles. The same Mordecai principles that apply to, to, to King Esther back then apply today when it comes to uh, having a color blended church we n must follow the mordecai principles we must have remember that our allegiance before country before conference before country before culture must be to god you cannot say well we've been in this system for so long that we need to keep it we need to maintain it no again 
There's nothing that should be before our allegiance to God and to follow his law. Ellen White told us that the system must stay in place until the Lord reveals a better way. But I'll tell you what, I'll be honest. I, um, if you want more information about how regional conferences and state conferences are established, I, I don't want to be, you know, hell, oh, what could I do about this? But I did write a book about this. Not specifically just this. It's called Talking Over Haystack, 25 Thoughts on Ministry, Leadership, and the Future Adventism. I'm going to give this away for free. I have lots of copies, but I've never promoted it because I don't want to be like, oh, look, I wrote a book about this. But if you want something, I'll send it to you for free. You just cover shipping. If you want more information on this, you can go to my website, nelsonfernandez.com, or email the church um, office at miamitemplesda.org, and we'll be more than happy to send you a copy for free. You just pay for shipping and handling because the point is we want to educate and want to inform. But in this book, I said that we should consider um, abolishing regional conferences and state conferences and bringing something together. I've since changed my, my thought on this because I believe, you know what? I'll let one of our own members explain this because I really think he succinctly nailed this on the head. Um, if you hit the slide up, one of our members said this, after one of these police executions, I think it was Michael Brown, Dan Jackson, this is the NAD, uh, from the NAD issued a statement, which was calling for peace, reconciliation, and justice. Some of the comments on that post from our militant deficient brother, and this is, a, a, in other words, to say white person. By the way, the person that wrote this was white. It's, he's a good friend of mine. He's here in the church. Um, I love you, Brandon. Um, we're extremely hateful and <laughs> defending the indefensible actions of the officer. It got me thinking is one unintended benefit of regional conferences that our African-American brothers and sisters are being somewhat insulated from the hate of their white brethren? Is God using regional conferences to protect them? Or does the separation mean that black folks don't have to, or white folks don't have to face their unchristian latent racism? Maybe. It's possible. Um, I'll tell you this. Something I put on Twitter recently is that um, the idea is that this goes, the idea that white is the, and again, I, I love white people. I'm married to half a white person. I, I, I pastor white in a white conference. The problem isn't with whites. I want you to understand. It's a human problem. We all have racism in us, but you can't simply just be like, oh, let's just love each other then and God will fix everything for us. That's not how it works, folks. God requires us to act. So um, where was I going with this? Um, yeah, so the idea is that God is not going to do away with this simply because kumbaya, we're going to make this feel good. God requires us to act. Um, but the other thing that he mentioned, which I want to point to here, is that we divide, our, we divide because we won't live together. There's no reason why we can't expect, why we can't expect uh, that we have allowed Satan to influence how we think about our brothers and sisters, and we aren't willing to give up that part of our lives to God. We want to retain control about how we view the other rather than looking through God's eyes. We want to live in a world of our own construction based on mistrust and lies. We can live together. We do a pretty good job, not perfect, but pretty good here at Miami Temple, which is, is true, amen. But we won't because we aren't fully sold out to the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I thought originally the idea is to break the structure down and to start again. But where I'm at now, looking at the history of our church, looking at what, 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 what the Bible teaches, how Jesus, who had it all, took on the form of a servant and served. Where I'm at right now is that I think it actually makes more sense logistically, financially, uh, theologically. If our church really wants to adopt and show the world that it's willing to amend itself, then I think the integration has to happen, state conferences into regional conferences. The people who were historically seen as the labor. Listen, I'm talking, my wife can trace her lineage back to the Mayflower because... Her ancestors were listed as passengers. Mine are listed as cargo. So at some point, I can't follow my history back. All I have is a DNA test that tells me more or less where I come from. And historically, there were institutions built to separate. And it's still that way today, right now, as I'm speaking today. But if we want to show the world that Adventism is going to turn the corner and is going to start abolishing and apologizing for the past and start living into a better future, then it makes sense for those who have been historically the ones who have disenfranchised to say, listen, we were in the wrong, so we're going to move in with you. Instead of saying, oh, well, you can come with us. And there's actually a petition that's being passed around right now 
that says we should ab abolish regional conferences, but most of them are coming from people that work in the state conferences. I work in a state conference, but again, it's almost like you can't ignore history. And I do believe that we do have to have conversations about the role of authority, uh, the, the, how we manage structure, and how we manage leadership. Uh, because you can't have turnover. You can't do what some conferences do and just move pastors every three or four years. We have to talk about this. But those are ancillary issues. When it comes to the root of it, if we really want to move forward, we got to stop playing games. We got to stop playing square games about who's going to be in charge and who's going to cover this. Those are all ancillary matters. The thing that God wants to fix is our hearts. Because too many of you are giving a bad example to the Lord and to other people by what you're sharing and what you're doing, what you're posting. And the Lord sees it. He sees it. Mordecai was someone who stood on principle. He recognized that he needed to act when it was time to act. It was time to be quiet when it was time to be quiet. And I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quit. But the question I want to leave you with, church, is what is Jesus to you? Is Jesus someone who basically just signs off on all of your beliefs and doesn't leave you unchanged? Is Jesus someone who basically is just there to keep you company until you die and then you can go to heaven in your racism or in your hate of Democrats or hate of Republicans and think that God is going to just whatever? Yeah, I mean, you said all these nice things about me, but in your action and your words, is, you think God's going to be okay with you staying quiet or vilifying the other group? God's not going to take that. He's not. Jesus demands your allegiance because he is your friend. And we remember Jesus as our friend, but don't forget, he's also your king. He is your king. And as a king, this is not a democracy. The democracy is if everyone decides what's the best thing to do, then Jesus is going to change his mind in that sense. There's certain things that Jesus says because he is the king. He is the king. And don't give me that bind on earth and bind in heaven stuff. If it's something that's against God's character, he's going to be against it, period. Okay, so who is Jesus to you? I want to appeal to you, my friends, today as we're seeing what's happening around us and as you see what's happening and unfolding on social media. I ask, I implore you, I beg you to not be a part of the noise, to not be a part of the division, to not be a part of the confusion, because at the end of the day, that's what Babylon is. Babylon is the antithesis of God's remnant church. Babylon is confusion. And there's so much confusion out there right now, folks. What we need more than anything else is God's steady hand calling people to repentance, remembering that there's a loud cry to be had. There's repentance to be had. And if change is going to happen, it's going to have to happen, just like judgment in the house of God. Because I can guarantee you that if it doesn't happen here first, just like it's happened in historical times back then, God will leave the institutional church to its own devices. Ichabod, the glory has departed, and God will use other people if the elephant in the room is not addressed. And if we think that we're going to get to heaven by ignoring the race issue and just waiting until the Sunday law comes, when our early pioneers said that the reason why the United States is a two-horned beast is because of its treatment of black people and because of its stance on religious liberty. And if we ignore one at the expense of the other, God's going to be like, okay, you guys can keep your church. I'm going to work with all these other people you think are the evil ones. Don't relax. Don't sleep because God's still working. God will save his people. But where are you going to be at as we're working through this? Let's come together as a church. Let's pray and ask God to move among us and to change our hearts. That's my prayer for you today. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for this time you've given us. It's been a long sermon. I'm sorry, Lord. It's been long. But you put something on my heart, so I apologize. And I just ask God that you would send it to the hearts that need to hear it. Father God, there are leaders in our church that need to act. They need to, they need to move. Otherwise, Father, it's time for you to move them out. You need, Father, to act because in this world, I cannot see us being another 50, 60 years here with the same situation we're in. Father, I, can, I don't see myself being in this church 50, 60 years if nothing changes. Father, you need to act. You need to be here. And we ask, God, that you manifest in a very mighty way. You would move hearts after this message, that you would galvanize your people so that we can be an example, not just another voice of telling people what you should do and not willing to do it ourselves. God, forgive us for, we have, for what we've sinned. Forgive us for our own prejudices. Forgive us for our own racism. Forgive us for our own indifference, God. And we ask, God, that knowing that you forgive everyone, that all are equal at the foot of the cross, that you would change and convict us starting today, that you would transform us and save us. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.